Good morning. Well, I've come here to talk about some pollination and volunteers and give you a little garden update. A lot of the Drexo has already emerged and more stuff is going into the pots. That's the red scarlet runner bean. I'm going to see if uh, I can find somebody to take these volunteer watermelon at the end of the season. Aiden uh, wanted to smash some of the smaller watermelon. And there's a volunteer right there. And then there's also one back there. We got a couple days of of rain in the evening, which really helps out with the workload. The borage has come up in between the tomato plants. I'm not seeing much growth on these uh, black futsu squash, so I'm going to boost those up and, and hit that a little bit heavier with the compost tea. Unbelievable amounts of volunteer of the basil, the Texas hummingbird sage, and all of the lychee tomatoes here are the volunteers. Lots of the lemon balm, as I you know, was saying in the earlier videos, and the wildflowers. But this bed, I actually did a sowing of the wildflower mix, and I'm going to thin it out and spread those to a few different places. There's the other runner bean that I put in. And the sweet marjoram, I split that and moved that to the back bed. I'm starting to see some drying take place on the turnip pods. So that's going to be quite a job. There's, there's a lot of those. I also split the Russian sage and moved that to the herb bed out back. Strawberries are doing nicely. Rodents and birds, it's a battle. And the blackberry collection is also uh, doing nicely. So, I've got some drying out on the pods on the dinosaur kale. Passion flowers that Michael Weed whacked here have actually spread. And these look like they're, they're coming back. And I was watching a friend's video and reading some of the comments. And they said they had uh, got their fig tree from their mom's tree just by taking the low-lying limbs and through the season uh, bricking it to the ground and it rooted. So instead of the rooting hormone, that's what I've done with two of the limbs here and if this lower one gets uh, bigger and enables me to get that to the ground I'm going to do that too but the baby figs have already started but they take a really long time to develop and this is just you know this is a wonderful wonderful uh, tasting fruit all right the Russian emerald apple tomato plants I'm starting to see some nice growth there and I put in a lot of transplants in direct so into this area. Uh, I'm not so sure about the blackstrap molasses now. The I don't know if the ants had moved from the strawberry pot up front just because I had disturbed them so many times. But I had doused this one really, really heavy. A few times with spray solution and granules and these ants aren't going anywhere I might just take that out of the pot and um, and try to boil as many of those ants as I can this is that casa banana and this thing I direct sewed it out back and I'm going to take it up over the trees. It said it can actually strangle a tree um, because the vines are so vigorous. So 
I'm going to try to put this, I'm going to till up a little place out front and run it over that split rail fence. That doesn't do much of anything. Lots of the ground cherries have emerged, lots more tomatoes, and I'm seeing a very low germination rate on the lime green tobacco. This is the tobacco from the seed company. Just as long as I get, you know, nice 810 plants, I should be able to get a good seed stock from it. And this is a Thai red Roselle, Roselli, and this produces a very bright red berry that's used for uh, coloring drinks and jams and that pies and that type of stuff. That's my first year with this. I had some, I had some uh, carrots with roots in the refrigerator so I decided to I've tried this before and I know it works but uh, the squirrels usually s nibble on the tops of the carrots and, and ruin it or I move or whatever and I never get to uh, see it but carrots are biennials so you grow the carrot and then you pull them and you give them some cold storage and then you put them back in the ground for seed production they produce a seed in the second season so uh, just a couple days ago, these were all discolored and um, dead tops, and now they've got the growth. This isn't the best place for the asparagus, but it was root-bound in the pots. So I did my best into separating it into a couple little areas, and so now there's some Mary Washington asparagus in here. Bell peppers back there, lychee tomatoes all along. Uh, this is a crookneck yellow squash did the transplant really nice this year I'm going with as much of the tomatoes in with the squash as I can to provide that ground cover uh, to uh, you know give them a more consistent water supply and here it hasn't emerged yet but this is a new one to me and this is chufa and this is a nutty root and it'll produce a little bed of grass. You sow about four of these little dried out nuts in one square foot and then the whole thing will be taken over by the grass and then come fall, you lift it up and you collect the roots. Eat them, save some of them for next year's uh, growing. So I can't wait to taste that. I did a direct sow of the Asian wing bean I had said I'd never seen anything like that before. Nice, vigorous vines last year and not one flower on it. And this is a, a Italian squash, a large variety, Marina. And I'm not going to butcher the name. So the transplants are doing good. And the direct sows have emerged. And also tomatoes along with it. And this is the Caribbean amaranth green calboa or something like that. I'll put it in the description box. Great growth on the on the transplants of the lychee tomato. They're taking off really nicely. Sorry about the camera work. We got a uh, we got nice blossoms coming on those lychees too. I'm gonna have to pull those back and and tie them up. They get pretty big. About the size of a uh, large tomato plant. We got um, another round of the manure that I've been working on. And the uh, cucumbers are starting to spread. In another three weeks or so, I'm going to uh, start the lemon apple cucumbers or another variety of cucumbers indoors. Lots more volunteers showing up of the Love Lies Bleeding Amaranth. I moved the warm wood and some uh, lamb's quarters, rosemary, out out to this little area. These guys are lagging behind. These are the subarctic planting. They were planted at the same time that the um, emerald apple. And they're not as big. And there's the lychee tomatoes along the fence line. I got the grass out of there the other day. And I'm going to have, um, I think it's the Black Hopi squash near this tomato bed. 
And this is where I put more of the chufa. The first year with a variety, I like to uh, put it in a couple different spots and see where it does best, especially if I plan on staying. And then I, I make little notes on, on what's doing well. And the Alibaba watermelon showing some growth, and, and that's from Iraq. My second round of watermelon this year is going to be a, a sh white sugar lump, and it's a rare variety. This area right here, I dug a ditch and put a broken down log, the, the size of that ditch, I would say about five feet. I moved a five foot decomposing log in there. I layered it with compost and manure, put in some of the garden soil from the back, the richer stuff, and put in my amendments. And I'm going to, I'm trying, um, the squash. This is uh, the marina squash that's up front. Direxo of the Asian wing bean. They were in the back main garden last year. Did nothing. And this is my last of the seeds, so hopefully this year I'll get a seed stock. The potatoes are coming up incredibly well, the greens. So now my ditches are turning into mounds. Oh, there's one who's popped back out even after I covered it just a couple days ago. I've got the fence line ready to go for some more tomatoes back there too. Let's go over here first. I haven't done any direct sow yet and that's on my hit list but there's a lot of transplant of the that's the sweet marjoram, marigolds, uh, wormwood, Russian sage, Texas hummingbird sage, basil, lemon balm, and wildflowers and mint. Wow. Now I suspect that that's volunteers. I suspect that's a lot of the wildflowers. And here you can see where they're spaced is where I put some of the wildflowers from up front. I shot a video. I wanted to talk about corn pollination. Normally I don't deal with corn. Uh, I've, I've done the black Aztec corn and did a couple crops of that and had, had good luck with it. And then I planted a Japanese popcorn and the squirrels ate two crops of that. So then I just gave up. And back here we are, we do have quite a squirrel population. So we'll see how this one goes. The uh, De Sicily uh, gourds are showing some growth. Black Hopi is showing really nice growth. And I'm not sure what tomatoes I put there. Huh. Losing my tags or just forgetting to put them in. Direct sow on the Black Hopi has all come up. I'm up to probably close to 30, 35 of the Black Hopi squash and only one seed didn't show, pop up. And so I dug down and there wasn't a seed. So I think we may have had a, a squirrel come by and grab it. Okay, this is my corn bed and corn is predominantly wind pollinated, it could carry two, two and a half miles. I suspect it may even go uh, further than that. And I have a nice cushion of trees all around me. And the um, even though the county is largely agricultural, I don't have a lot of corn being grown around me. So I figured I'd give it a try here. And this is bloody butcher corn. Okay, so it's wind pollinated. It pollinates very easily, but it's only a short window of opportunity between when it releases the pollen and the females are receptive. So with the GMO being the way it is and how easily corn crosses, you can bag it after you pollinate it. And I read that for the best crop possible on corn, a six inch spacing between the plants and a one-foot row. I don't 
do rows, I do a spiral pattern. And normally it's just one big coil, but here I did two. One over there going around that basin, and then one over here, and then kind of just intermittently put some in here. Now I do have a handful of seeds left to plug in of where maybe I had missed sowing them, or they uh, is a lack of germination, and I gotta get Belle out of here. She's breaking the corn off. Anyway, that's the corn deal. You can bag it and make sure that your stock stays pure. The uh, melons are up. It's a French variety of cantaloupe, the finest cantaloupe I've ever tasted. And this year my approach is fewer varieties, but more of each. And this is the Casa Banana Direct So is in there. And this is more of the uh, Hopi Squash Direct So. Shalu is up. And it looks like I have some nibblers on that. Hmm. What do you think, guys? Do you think I should just, you know, maybe put the dog house out here and chain the dog up in the garden? Get a cat? I don't know. <laughs> I'm... I uh, have my rodent problems and bird problems. Here we have more of the squash up. And I did a direct sow of a Louisiana green velvet okra there. And I was kind of disappointed about the amount of seeds that I, I got. I sowed all of the seeds into that um, little spot. And that's a two rows a foot apart and in between their three inch spacing, double road of three inch spacing, and then another foot in between, and then same thing. One, two, one, two, all the way across. Now I've seen um, my one variety of okra, the white velvet was enormous. You would have never been able to pull that spacing off. So make sure you do some research on your spacing, especially if you're into seed production. All along here are transplants of the ground cherry. I'm gonna do a lot of those this year. I really, really enjoyed those. And then I did a direct sow. And because we typically don't get a lot of water rain here, and um, I wanted to conserve the moisture, I did the straw over the top just like you would for seeding grass. And when I see them get about, oh, I'd say about a half inch to, uh, yeah, about a half inch high, I'll pull that hay off. And then I'll start when they get about um, four leaves on them, I'll do a, a transplant, spread them out, thin them out. Oh, goodness. Um, this is another Direxo of a berry. And this might be the Wonderberry. Yeah, this is the Wonderberry. The Wonderberry I'm not too impressed with for flavor. Uh, it's a dark, small berry, but I do like the fact that the plant isn't spiny or uncomfortable in any way, and it's prolific, and I'm gonna use that as a filler for some of my other pies and, and you know, jam. Maybe, you know, do some blackberry, Wonderberry, and uh, ground cherry mix, see how that turns out. So I still have a lot more space to plant in back here. The Alibaba Direxo, there's a lot of watermelon that's gonna be happening. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 mounds with a seed in them each plus the five up front. And they're supposed to be pretty heavy producers. And they're also supposed to have a, a lighter skin, which prevents them from being sun scorched. And they're supposed to be excellent uh, for long-term storage, for a longer term storage. No watermelon's gonna be really long. And this is uh, a perpetual spinach chard that's here. And I did the beets here which they haven't emerged yet. Oh, yeah, there they are. Some are coming up. Borage and more of the futsu squash. So that is, that's the update. I don't think I have 
the last time I shot this video, I was like, oh, I should have said this. Oh, here we go. This is the rare bronze arrow that overwintered, and I started the seed collection. And here we have just the flower buds. We have the yellow flowers, and here is one that's already starting to dry out. So if you want maximum seeds off your lettuce, you have to collect every day because they don't all come into maturity at the same time like the pod plants do. It's got that dandelion fluff on it, so once it dries out here in the mid-afternoon sun, I'll come in and I'll collect all those little black seeds in there. All right, baby squirrel has been out for a week and a half. She comes out every day, spends most of the day outside, and then was coming in for an afternoon nap, and then at night time to sleep. Yesterday, she went up into the big oak tree, and as I was watching her, I spotted a squirrel nest. And this is most likely the nest that she came from. So there she, there she is. So she's spending her days exploring the big trees now. And last night, um, Michael went and got her and brought her in for the evening. And she was just, she was just exhausted. But I brought her out here very early this morning. Yeah, she's gonna be fine. I watched her um, digging yesterday because all of the acorns that I'm finding around here on the ground are rotten. I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm worried about what she's going to find to eat. And she was digging right near the potato patch with me. And she came across underground um, an acorn. So those little holes, that's her digging. And here's where she was and she found an acorn that was actually had fresh flesh in it. It's amazing. I think animals are so amazing. Smell a nut under the ground. Wish I could do stuff like that. Okay. I'm off and running. I'm going to go get some berries. And I'm going to do some more sowing today. And pff, lots of weeding. And there we have some seed heads starting on Sky Bird Bird's uh, Egyptian walking onions that she gave me. All right, talk to you later. Hope you have a great weekend. Bye.